Tony Hall is a veteran in bovine nutrition, and uh, he's going to talk to him this talk to us this morning. Excuse me, Tony. Uh, you'll notice his uh, delightful brogue. He's been educated in the UK, and he'll talk a little bit more about his background and his topic. And we'll let Tony jump right in and get started. Tony, welcome. Thank you for being with us. Thanks, Joel. Presentation. So, first of all, as George Bernard Shaw said, we're separated by a common language. I have a habit of speaking too fast. I'm going to try and cool the jets and go easy. If I say something you don't understand or I go too fast like this, slow me down. So, I'm with Lola Mond and thank you to Dairy Business for allowing us this opportunity. Uh, just again, mention my colleagues here Bill Needham, Kate Robbins, and our North East distributor, Jeff Durkin from Cornerstone Nutrition. Uh, our booths over there. But as Joe said in the introduction, all the sponsors here, please do visit them and see what we've got to say. Uh, we're all grateful for the support. I'm grateful for this opportunity. Uh, you see the title of the slide, it's a dollar a cow a day. Where's that going wrong? How's that happening? All I'm trying to do here is kind of get the thought processes going. I don't think it's too controversial what I'm going to put in front of you for the next 40, 45 minutes. But it might be, depending where you're coming from. But I think as you think about this show and other public seminars like Moving Towards, what we learned about Shredwich, at least this opening presentation may just give you some ideas and thought about how cows are reacting to you know, the modern type of diets that we put in front of them. So Cliff, if we could check the next slide, please. Oh, going backwards, that's okay. Well, there's a nice picture of non-TMR cows. Okay, we got that. Now what? We seem to have lost the signal from the computer there, Cliff. I have somebody's presentation, but not mine. <coughs> Bear with us, folks. Slight technical hitch. So I'll I'll start I'll start backgrounding while we while we rescue this on the TV. So what, the journey I'm going to lead you down here is uh, how we've got it back. And the next slide, please, sir. There we go. Okay. So we're back where we need to be, and the journey we're going to take is looking at how we feed cows and how the cows respond to the ration, not what the computer tells you. The computer's great at crunch, crunching numbers, can do things for the third or fourth decimal place. But as you know, and you've heard this before, cows can't read a computer printout. What we want to do is move away from where City Boy is, you know, that kind of urbane look at rations, if you see that kind of diet approach over there, a delicious, sumptuous mix of different things. We're in the real world. We're kind of hoping that our nutritionist has got things formulated the right way. We need to have that conversation. But more importantly, the feed team on the farm acts as the people who are unable or disable the ration from working. So we've got to hope that the feed team is on the ball and that they're looking at that ration, they're looking at pen numbers, they're looking at pen movements, and we are putting down the right ration in front of the right pen of cows. You'll be surprised sometimes that doesn't happen, not your farm, somebody's farm, it has happened. The right ration in front of the right pen of cows, in the right amounts, with the type of weight that refusals that we expect, okay? Checking forage dry matters, all those good things. So making sure those cows are enabled from that ration and fed correctly, and more importantly, consistently every day. So that's where we'd like to be. Any change in that is going to challenge the cow because the way she's going to digest is through the rumen, which is a big fermentation fat. And we won't spend too much time on the physiology, but we're all aware of that. She's not a monogastric. She's a fermentation fat. And 65 to 70% of what takes place is going to take place in fermentation and digestion through the rumen. Next slide, please. So, We've had a move, I think, across the industry, although this will vary geographically, but certainly in the northeast, towards high forage TMR, and I think this makes sense. If we can get the high quality materials that we need in terms of forage, and I suppose in this case, this is going to mean NDF digestibility, and rate value, or KD, as you see in the reports, so we can get higher inclusions of the forage. If we get a poor quality forage, or a badly fermented forage, we're not going to get those those high inclusions. And there are all sorts of different ways of looking at this. 55, 60, 65% of the total dry matter intake is forage. Okay, 25, 26% of the forage, of the NDF is forage NDF. You can look at it a number of different ways. 
the bottom line is we're trying to squeeze in more high quality forage, reduce grain imports, reduce inputs, hopefully increase milk components. Again, bear that in mind as your strength this seminar comes up and we'll get some more information here to think about. And then improve herd health, that's often what people report. And one of the things that's often flagged that makes me interested in this is less serum, less sub-acute rumen acidosis. And the question I've always asked myself is, how do we know? How do we know there's less serum? What is serum other than a girl's name? So let's take the next slide, please, Cliff. So we don't need to get too biological here, but as far as we're concerned, the research scientists working on this, their definition of serum, is going to be the amount of time we hold the threshold pH. Below that threshold pH of 5.8. So most of you would be aware that the optimum for rumen function is about pH 6.2, 6.5, 6.8. That's not by accident, just as an aside, and nothing to do with this presentation. Uh, if you came from outer space before you know, the humans populated the Earth, and you took a look at all the northern temperate grasslands, and you kind of did some pH, uh, pH readings on the top of grasslands that are available from northern China, northern Europe, and uh, northern Americas, uh, anybody care to guess what the typical pH of the temperate grasslands across the world are? 6.2, 6.5, 6.8. So it's not a surprise that the link between optimum room function and the pH of non-fermented materials. That's not really part of this presentation, but I want to get you thinking about the rumen. pH is a logarithmic scale. Every time you change by one unit, okay, you have a tenfold increase in acidity. So if you go from pH 6.8 to 5.8 for the rumen, that's a massive change on the rumen dynamics of the population. Generally speaking, we won't concern ourselves with this, but just for your reference point, the boffins of research this are going to say, Sarah, you're going to have that sub-acute rumen acidosis, which will have a financial impact on cows, when the pH stays below 5.8 for about 180 minutes or three hours a day. Bear that number in mind as we walk through some of these slides together be a few numbers on there we can we can kind of pay attention to. Okay? Once you get below 5.8 the farmer digestive bugs you know start to slow down and, and we get some we get some health challenges we're going to think about. Next slide please Cliff. So we don't always get to look inside our cows unless we follow through the slaughterhouse. Uh, certainly I'm sure this will be on your herd uh, but it might be sometimes on a neighbour's herd if you get some Dramatic increases in acidity, hydrogenized concentration of the rumen fluid, you do start to see some breakdown in the rumen epithelial there, and so that can start to lead to abscesses and uh, inflammation, and sooner or later, stuff can get in the bloodstream, and you can get sometimes nosebleeds, and you can get uh, liver abscesses, and then you get an unhealthy cow. Um, again, not on your farm, but maybe on your neighbor's farm. One of the signs you might see, and the problem is these things have other issues tied to them, you may just see here some loose or variable manure. We're going to talk about metrics that we may be able to use, but all these metrics are going to be confounded, which is why it's a great time for discussing with your feed team and your nutritionist on a regular basis, starting something simple like regular forage dry matters, working all the way up to make sure that that mix is loaded accurately, efficiently, and consistently, so that ration is enabled. I keep coming back to that. The ration on paper is enabled in front of the cows, and they can't sort it. Okay, the next slide, please, please. So, at the farm level, this serous subacute rumen acidosis isn't always easy to see. But sometimes you do get a you do get a food clues. Uh, the problem is you've got to segregate the clues out against other things that are going on. So, when you get a challenge or an insult, you might not know there could be a time delay between how the cows react and when that insult took place. So your feeding chain may have made a mistake. Sometimes you can see this on herds, it's kind of interesting, I don't know how many people see this. Some very large farms have a different feeding crew for the weekend compared to the Monday to Friday shifts. And depending on how conscientious the weekend crew is, you can sometimes see some differences in cow performance on the two to empty compared to what the weekend crew. Probably your crew are better trained than that, and that doesn't happen, but I can see that on large farms around in Mexico, Texas, California. We like to use cow side observations and as many metrics as we can that we feel we can record. 
we don't need to make recordings for the sake of it. There's two ways of approaching this analysis of this particular issue. Part of it is recorded data and part of it is cast side observations. So one of the things we want to do more and more with a nutritionist is we want to get the nutritionist out of the truck, not driving through the free store barn from the truck cab thinking to see the cows. I'm sure yours don't do that. I've seen plenty on the west of the US that do that. But we get half up, clean the boots, and actually get walking amongst the cows and look for some of these signs and then spend some time on dairy comp, scout, or whatever program you're using to look at some of the other metrics that might be giving us clues as to what's going on. Okay. So for instance, we can spend we can spend some counting time, the period of time, a number of hours after the cows have been fed, say three, four, five hours, cows that are lying down, chewing the quill or ruminating. Also that gives you a clue as to how well the cows are like those free stores. Lying down and chewing the quill is a preferred method of recycling as much salivary bicarbonate as possible. Salivary bicarbonate has a pH of about 10 or 11, so it's therefore an alkali. So the more bicarbonate we can make and swallow, the more the cow can help us so buffer some of that movement acidity. So rumination of culture is a bit like having your own built-in rollways or tongues. You know, so physically effective fiber in the rash is important to encourage as much good chewing. Assuming I don't talk too long, we'll see them on the slide just kind of walking us through them. We see the variable bubbling manure, fecal losses, material going through the too high rate of passage, a classic case with the using whole cotton seed. Whole cotton seed is an unusual feeding region and a good one. I'm not saying whether it's priced right or wrong at the moment. Biologically, it's one of the few what we'll call grain oil seed ingredients in the world that actually floats in the room. So it has the characteristics of the forage, although it feeds like a grain. So a lot of people on high corn silage based diets, where the physically effective fiber might be limiting, it's not unusual to pull in some whole cotton seed. And that takes it way above the normal breaking when you look at this just on an energy and protein basis. Cotton seeds bring something else to the table. Now that's in terms of rumen function, flow in the rumen map. If you don't believe me, go at home, grab a handful of cotton seeds, stick it in deep cool water, you'll find it makes a rumen map. So it's physical approach in the rumen belies, you know, its analysis and, and its relative economic value. But where I'm going for this is it floats so well and takes time to chew down. If you see whole cotton seed in the liver, you've got a rate of passage problem or something else is going on in the cows, some rumen dysfunction. So if you use some of these things at these markets, I mean somebody has to actually go over like this or maybe just take time to wash the liver. Stuff I think we're all familiar with, but we maybe don't do it in one regular way. How many people see soil or concrete making? Well, not on your farm, your neighbours. Unusual ones, soil or, or concrete making, could spit it. People with horses are very familiar to quitting, sheep will quit from time to time. You see quitting or could spit in dairy cows, you've got a problem. Now, I'm not saying the problem is always Sarah, but we'll think Sarah will think mycotoxins as well. The issue we're getting to here is some of the things that we see are co confounded the contributors, and there actually is a relationship between Sarah and mycotoxins. You can talk to our, our old tech uh, sponsor over there, but the more you let the pH get below 6 and close to 5.8, the more potent some of the mycotoxins are in the room. So there's a clear relationship between room management and the activity of mycotoxins and what you think your binder might do. So if you see soil licking or concrete licking or could spit it, talk to your vet nutritionist and get a meeting together with the feeding team. Let's go through it together. Now here's something for a bit nebulous. We can think of low milk fat. Low milk fat is an issue, it's a challenge because we could actually just be feeding too much of saturated oil. In our US rations, we tend to feed a lot of corn oil, like corn silage, corn grain, high moisture shell oil. So we're always pushing our cows towards the low butter fat, and that's a challenge for us uh, in, in the US. But one metric we can do is just to give us a clue about that, whether there's something else going on in the cows, what a fat inversion. Anybody that's getting multiple testing can look at the fat inversions where the fat is equal to or lower than the milk protein. That's the inverted butter fat. I can't speak for the uh, Channel Island brief, but I can tell you in black and white there's a natural genetic tendency to about 10, 12, 15% butter fat inversions, 1, 5, 15%. If you see that, it's not a big deal. You start seeing butter fat inversions creeping towards 20, 25, 30. I've been on some farms where the butter fat inversions are as high as 45, 50% on fats of 3.2. That's giving you a clue that the cows are sorting and they could be gorging either too much oil or they could have a, a serum issue as well. And this, this crop in butter fat, in 
relation to what goes on in the rumen, the more set we would have in the rumen, the more that saturated fatty acid is made into something called conjugate linoleic acid. One, two, three, four grams of conjugate linoleic acid in the small intestine can drop the bullet fat by two, three, four percent. So there are economic consequences for not managing the rumen correctly. Low bullet fats and bullet fat inversions are typically one of the groups that we can think about. So, the excess body weight change, but that could be other issues. Energy, the diet, the predisposes to this. Laminitis is, 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 is a clear sign. We might see that a little bit later on in the season after heat stress, or touch on heat stress um, in a moment. And uh, the problem is, no one of these things solely on its own is, a, is, is, a, is a, an indicator uniquely to say that this is co confounded with other issues. And so we need to get together as a team and do some exploration. Can we take the next slide, please? So I want to take a close look at corn silage. One of the, one of the forages that's used an awful lot in the northeast in terms of pushing forage for obvious reasons, one cup, self-drying, huge tonnage, not so painful to make as multi-cups of hay for the season. So corn silage tends to be our main forage base in the northeast and across a lot of the US, apart from most drought and the more sorghum. One of the things about corn silage, this is going to strike you as obvious, but I want to say it. struck me as interesting coming from Europe. We can now look at all those numbers there and you can get bored, or I could just say corn silage is like high munchy shell corn on a stick. Just think about that for a minute. Corn silage is like high munchy shell corn on a stick. When you plug corn silage into the compute, you get the analysis back. The compute thinks it's the forage, because that's the section it goes into. So you always feel pretty safe and comfortable. I'm feeding the high forage ration. What about if I told you from the starch value of your corn grain, just suppose your starch value in your corn silage is 30%. It's not too high, it's not too low. Some might more, some will get less if we don't have a, a good growing season. But well, 30% starch in a corn silage on a dry matter basis means that whole pan corn silage dry matter contains about the equivalent of 40% high washed shell corn. When we're taking that corn silage, we're going to take an high washed shell corn. So that starch is moist and pretty reactive, or certainly can be. So what, one of the things I want, want you to take away from here is every pound, okay, every pound of corn silage that you, you put into the ration, you have 0.6 pounds of stover and 0.4 pounds of high moisture shell corn equivalent. Now, we want to curdle process that. My argument is not against curdle processing. I'm all for it. My position is we need to curdle process the Jesus out of corn silage and there's some stuff on shredlage may or may not be the answer for you. Curiously, I think if we keep pushing ourselves to keep our rollers our wrong tight and our kernel processes tight, we can get where we want to be with conventional corn silage. I'm not part of that dialogue in two days. But we need this corn silage kernel process to make that starch fermentable. What we need to do in formulating our rations is realize that some of that starch can be available and, and is in fact grain in disguise, and that will change over a period of time. Green corn silage starch is not as fermentable as cooked, let's call it corn silage starch. So the corn silage will be a different animal January, February, March, April than it will be, say, from there to October, November, December. Next slide, please. So I wanted to just walk you through a piece of work that we did in terms of looking inside the window of a cow. This is a typical northeast um, silage ration, a little bit further north and eastern here. This is based on conventional corn silage, BMR corn silage, some alfalfa grass mix, got some chopped straw in there for physically effective fibre, and um, a grain blend balancer. So when you look at this on a dry matter basis, what you see is it's 58.4% dry matter, and the rest is grain. But if you then put that 40% rule on that corn silage there, and kind of have a look what the contribution of grain from the corn silage is, and add this together, even though this is perceived to be a really safe ration, in terms of 25.6% forage NDF and 50% forage on the computer dry matter basis, what this ration is really giving to the cow, how the cow and the is going to see this, is 45.5% forage, that's the corn stover, the straw, and the alfalfa grass haymage, and then the rest is the grain fraction, which is dry grain blend, okay, and then the bit of the corn silage that is the kernel processed grain. Next slide, please. Okay. So this ration is uh, in the day. Oh, just back one, sir. So 
this ration of the day, 27% starch, typical NDF levels, nothing remarkable apart from I guess these day, this day and age we're feeding a lot more food protein than you know three, three years ago than we are now, but nothing too remarkable about it. We had both control and treatment cows on this farm, large numbers of them, 60 in each pen, uh, matched for milk yield and days of milk production. What I want to do is walk you through a little observation trial here, looking inside the can using the remote PH bowlers. Next slide, please. This is the current remote pH bolus. Uh, I don't know how many you can see, there's a little light on there. So this pH bolus has been um, calibrated, so it's going to measure the pH remotely in the rumen. We're going to get that inside the cow. This type of design of bolus is going to lodge more likely in the reticular area of the rumen reticulum, kind of where your magnets might go if you were doing something with magnets for hardware disease. So that's where it's going to be. And we have the next slide, please. I think we can walk through this one. We've obviously got to find a way of getting it in, so not surprisingly, we're going to do it the old fashioned way. We're going to get the bolus in there, the time on the fashion, so we're going to load it in. Next slide, please, Cliff. And then we're hopefully going to find a willing volunteer uh, in the head lots. And uh, yeah, we have, we have uh, one of the cause of good research, so we're, we've got all our cows with remote room and pH boluses, and then as a duty of care, that there was a vet on the farm while well, this was being done. Next slide, please, Cliff. You know, we, we wait half day a day and keep checking the cows, but the long stem hay wasn't part of the ration. Of course, the free trial protocol just to make sure all these cows that had the boluses were fit to come up with nothing untoward, done, gone on with the dosing mechanism, and just made sure the cow's appetite was right before we set off for the pre trial and the trial period. So, so that was 476 being the dose, should we say there. And she's, she's back on appetite again. Next slide, please, Ben. So this is Marybeth on Darza. It looks like she's got a magic wand. In fact, she's got a telemetric recorder. What she can do now on, on those cows anywhere, as they come into the, the lanes for milking, in the collecting area, or even just around the free stalls, about every uh, three or five minutes, that remote pH bolus is collecting temperature and pH and one to other metrics, and she can just wave that wand around the cow once, twice, three times a week. There's no great pressure, and it will download all that to the computer and give us a reading inside the cow as to what's going on with the pH. Now remember, this is structured to be really high forage ration. There's even shot straw in there for physically effective fiber. Next slide, please, Cliff. So to make this work, we're going to run with a mobile officer. So we can set the computer up in the back of the uh, back of the vehicle. We have an inverter for power just to keep things going. Next slide, please, Cliff. And uh, here you'll see a trace. This is uh, we did longer than this, but squeeze this in for you for six days here. This trace shows what's going on. There's a control set of cows and a treatment set of cows there. And let's just forget about the treatment at the moment. We'll focus on the control, which is kind of light blue or grey, if you can kind of see with me, that line there is 5.05, there's a lot of time and then control cows, even on that high forage diet, at below pH 5.8, which are obviously going to re reflect meal times, you know, feeding, push-ups, all sorts of activities there the feed book. There's also a treatment which actually spends a lot less time when you think about that in a moment. So the first point is, not now, not yet, this technology is too expensive to have on routine basis in commercial farms. But I think down the road for our vets and nutritionists and our feed team, we can see a time when remote room pH boluses are going to be available. We can use sentinel cows on the farm to measure exactly what's, what's going on with the cows. Next slide, please. I broke this down through a different way, uh, really just to talk about average pHs or mean pHs and then time under a baseline. Averages don't always tell you the true story. You saw the differences there on the pH traces as you look for the control. 6.03, the treatment is 0.22. Can I tell you what? Yeah, okay, it's 0.17 units, so I don't know. Is that really, you know, different? Um, minimum day pH, there was a difference there, 5.3 to 5.5. The maximum, yeah, you know, 6.8, 6.9. Remember what we said at the beginning about definition of SARE as far as the scientists are concerned is the amount of time below pH 5.8. If we break this down here, control counts 26% of the day, 378 minutes they are exposed to some acute amounts of doses. 
we didn't know it, we thought we were safe, it was a high flow of ration, but there it was. There was a treatment there that was employed and broke down to 141 minutes below the threshold time. That's a low risk situation of 10%. So the take home message here is that the SARE is around on our farms, and at the moment we've got experimental ways of measuring this on commercial herds. But they'll come a time when we'll have stuff like this to help us to give us a bit more ammunition along our cow side metrics or our dairy cop uh, analysis and look back versions and stuff like that. Take the next slide, please. Take. So I don't want to be uh, I don't want to be um, overtly commercial, but I don't know if anybody saw on that slide, I can do it in point it out, but just to reference as we walk through this, the difference between the SARE cows and non SARE cows was to the milk yield response as well. In, a, in excess of three pounds. So subacute rumen acidosis is, is a quiet robber of the field. And uh, that was heading towards statistical significance on that, on that number of cows. So some of the points I'm going to make here is just having a high forage TMR alone is not necessarily a guarantee against acidosis. We can think of the reason why. We use a lot of corn silage, so we need to adjust to that. Our adjustment's going to have to take place through the season as the corn silage cuts through starts changing its digestibility in the root. It will be a far more aggressive animal from March, April, May when we get that spring acidosis situation and our forage base is all cooked down. Most cows on that high forage diet had sarah of 25% a quarter day, so they were in trouble. Yeah, they were in fact, that may give some root health problems down the road, particularly as we move into this time of the year. One of the points I want to make on that trial, it was done under cool temperate conditions. You know, so cool temperate, February, March, April, not exactly heat wave. Today we've got heat and humidity. That changes the game for the cows, and we're going to touch on that in two or three slides. Uh, got a bit of time, so stay with me and hopefully I'm not putting you to sleep. I'm so far, so good, okay. So, Sarah significantly reduced by the treatment, and there was a milk yield response to the treatment. So, there the take home messages. We look inside. We have technologies that Bill and Caitlin and Jeff have talked about and I stall there that will help mitigate against uh, But this is not so much a commercial presentation as, as an eye opener, so Cliff, if I can trouble you for the next slide, please, sir. So, this was this one study, and uh, you were thinking, well, the guy from Lollamond, I guess he would say that, wouldn't he? It's, it's his study. So, what I wanted to do is kind of walk you through the literature, not just what I say. Everything I've got here in front of you will come from the Journal of Dairy Science, so this is peer reviewed published research, and these are really just ideas I've taken from the literature. Uh, this is a piece of work done at uh, Karen Bokerman's uh, place of research in Canada, which does a lot of this type of work on cow behavior, cow feeding, subacute women acidosis challenges. Uh, this was one of her uh, post grad students in 2002, and what this shows you, there's a lot of numbers here, don't worry about all the numbers unless you want to worry about all the numbers. All this shows is the forage to concentrate ratio going from 40 to 60, 40% forage, 60% grain. That's high grain inclusion. That's like when I first came over 16 years ago. Okay, corn meal was less than 100 bucks a ton. Gas hadn't quite got to what, $1.50? You know, we just fed corn meal to the cows. Who cares? It's cheap. So, I mean, those are the types of rations that we can see 10, 15, 20 years ago. It's kind of 50-50 on a dry matter basis, foraging grain, where we've been moving in the industry, and now at the other end, more where we think we need to position ourselves, assuming we don't get droughted and we have the forage inventory, we're going to move more towards this 60-40 uh, here. Shows exactly the same thing, different degree, but if you look on the bottom line here, I'm going to 5.8. In the old days, we were killing cows. We know that because our internal herd growth, our replacement rates, our turnover rates, we just know that. That was then, no need to chastise ourselves, you know, no matter what form the corn meal was, high moisture, it all ground. And that type of diet, nearly 46% of the time, cows are exposed to salmon. Challenging time in those 46 It improves a little bit to get to 50 50, it doesn't really go anywhere to get to 60 40. Again, primarily, wherever we're based with cereal silages, particularly things like corn silage, which let's be honest, most years if something's going to take a beat in this because of the Hayley's inventory is one that's going to struggle. Hopefully we can get enough corn silage together. So again, think, corn silage, I wash a shell corn on a stick. We need to be very careful how we ask our nutritionists to balance that ration and how we make sure we get our feet to use that ration correctly. You can reduce the incidence of Sarah by 
increasing the forage content of TMR, at least up to these numbers, and you can't eliminate it. And I'd go so far as to say, if you think about it, the way cows feed, we make that TMR available for 24 hours. We maybe feed once a day with regular push-ups. Sometimes in the summer we might feed twice a day with regular push-ups. But the cow feeding behaviour is going to take the street meals. Pretty large ones after the morning milking, probably after the evening milking as well, and then probably between 8 to 10 meals a day, depending on whether the first lactation heifers or multiparous cows. So there's a point where a cow always goes to eat the meal. When she eats the meal, those carbohydrates are going to digest. When you digest carbohydrates, you make volatile fatty acids and lactic acid. So at least eight to ten times a day, a cow is going to have more acid in the room, aka subacubrum acidosis. So the interesting thought process for the rest of the way we work with a feeder team and our nutritionists is not do modern dairy cows get subacubrum acidosis, because they do. Every time, ten times a day they take a meal, the rumen pH is going to drop. The real issue is how quickly can we rescue that rumen pH back, of, back above 5.8 and minimise the amount of time that we're exposed. So, don't let anybody march on the farm and tell you you don't have serum on your hook. You might have a really low percentage. You might have a moderate or high percentage. We can look at the metrics to find out. The point is, serum is an occupational hazard for the one dairy cow. Every time she takes a meal, the real issue is how quickly can we rescue it? Yeah, we need good diet formulation, we need good TMR mixing, and then with the technologies that can help us work through that. Next slide, please, Jeff. Okay, I apologise for putting a lot of numbers on you, but I just wanted to uh, back up that study. There's loads of other papers like that. This one is kind of surprising to me, and then not when you think about it. This is Greg Penner, 2007. We know the transition cow is the most important phase. We know there's a real unique change taking place in metabolism from pre-fresh to post-fresh. We know we've got a lot of things to wrestle with. Avoid milk fever and subclinical hypercalcemia. Avoid ketosis, avoid DAs. We also now need to think about avoiding serum. Uh, this piece of work here from Greg Penner, this is the serum line, less than pH 5.8, 70 to 80 percent post-fresh animals in that pen for one to 20 days. It still, it still goes on. There's, a, there's an adaptation period that's real difficult for them to get used to. And so the age-old ch chestnut is going to be kicked around the industry again, I think, for post-fresh cows. How hot dare we make the post-fresh ration, you know, to get them going up to full peak milk production, and how safe dare we make it to mitigate against serum. But do we have to put in technologies on the post-fresh cows you know, to make sure? We don't ignore the post-fresh cows. 71, 71, even out of 37 to 40 days, 79 to 70 animals exposed to serum. Next slide, please. Go. And the risk continues in the lactation, not surprisingly. This is work from researchers, there's a lot of this work, Garrett Hudson of Wisconsin doing a herd survey. Now, just so we know, Garrett's cutoff was 5.5, not 5.8. So if you use 5.8, you would expect the bars to be a lot higher. Okay, more towards the 30 to 40 percent. I didn't want to book you with it, so I used the original data. But all the way through here now, from 40 days lactation, right way out into post breeding and then towards mid lactation, there's a large percentage of our herd exposed to Sarah all the time. Robin milk production. Next slide, please. Here. So I hope I've made a bit of a case back around in Sarah. Um, here's a couple of things for you. So a question for the audience, because uh, my 58-year-old uh, vocal cords are getting tired, so let's have a bit of conversation here. What two things are going on here? Let's take one, okay, on your left. This could be a cow working into sound. What's happening here? Cows are sorted. Cows are sorted. So I mean, no matter how well we try and make it, we can pay attention to chocolate. The cow's natural feed behavior is to sort, so we need to try and stick things together. Once you start getting over 50, 52% dry matter of the TMR, it's very easy for the cows to soar. But they learn very quickly to put masters of particle physics, and you've seen them doing that with the tongue segregating things out. So that's that one. This photograph is not very good. Sorry about that, but this photograph here, if you can look closely at it, there's something going on there that you wouldn't like to see, particularly for three, four, five hours of the day. Yeah, it's no feed. So he's got the empty book syndrome. So somebody either miscalculated the forage drying matters or made a ration change, didn't expect, or 
work in the mixer the wrong way or the way cells are off, all sorts of things we can think about that would lead to that um, misplaced opportunity. What means is those cares are out of fees the next time they're looking for feedback and then how you are co-mingling in the number of aggressive cows, you've got cows that are real hungry and going to chow down real quickly. So the rate of TMR dry matter intake is, is going to be very high and they're going to predispose themselves to get into ruminant digestion and Sarah. Thanks Cliff, next slide please. So you know and I know there's all sorts of reasons that we need to be thinking about it to keep it practical. We want a high forage inclusion rate TMR, so we're going to go for early cut forages and heritage where we can, you know, different sorts of corn varieties, maybe BMR, may not be BMR, but certainly you'll be having that conversation about NDF digestibility on a 24 or 30 hour. You'll be having a conversation with your nutritionist about the rate values to make sure you've got the best quality forage. The thing about the best quality forage is it's also the least scratching, has the highest rate of passage. In the case of BMR, it can be very fragile as well. So you need to do a very careful dance when you have Highly digestible forage at high forage inclusions, we sometimes need to bring in the forages to make sure we slow the rate of passage down, balance off the fragility, and uh, you know, take account of the rate of digestion. I ask you to bear that in mind when you're thinking through your, your shred mature presentation in a couple of days. So you can still get high starches in these high forage TMRs, particularly based on the corn silage. More and more now, I think people are trying to get starch under control pay attention to non-fiber carbohydrates or, or, or NSC. Sometimes you can have forest chopped too short at harvest. That seems to be less and less of an issue, but there are certain techniques on some farms like ag bagging or tower silo and loaders that might actually put a unique signature on forage and make it shorter than you originally chopped it and put it in. So again, we resort to, we're getting our nutritionist to get the Penn State shaker box, dust the cobwebs off it, and uh, when we start to use that, just see exactly how things are. Poorly mixed TMR can take all sorts of uh, areas there. We've kind of talked about that. Maybe the loading and mixing procedures wrong. Maybe the forage is going too early. Yeah, maybe there's some free chopping going on with that thing. Maybe we're using the high forage TMR correctly for all the right reasons. But the mix hasn't changed over the years, and high forage TMRs are less dense than the typical diets we used to feed eight, eight, ten years ago. So now, it's from your farm or somebody's farm, which right by you see it, TMRs are the true capacity. That might even be boiling over sometimes. So you're not going to get a good TMR mix there, and that's going to predispose this ration to be sorted by the cow. So they can all be We mentioned corn silage changing in time. The starch digestibility, the spring acidosis thing where the starch is a lot more aggressive, assuming we've cut and processed it in the spring than it is uh, Lots of things that we do in the um, in the northeast in terms of co-mingling, separating heifers from mature cows as great as we can. Stocking densities in pens is always a challenge. The bank has one view, you know, the husband repeating the owner had another. Sometimes you meet in the middle. I know if we listen to Rick Grant and I think he's right, once you get to that 30% of the stocking that we've got challenges, but certainly in the transition camera area, we know we've got to be nowhere near that at all. 100% or less would be ideal. But just think about your own farm. Anytime you've got aggressive feeding situations with overstocking, changing in pen movements, first lactation, heifers competing against mature cows, then we've got issues. Okay, how often do we push the TMR up? You know, the cows have to reach, do we push it up often enough? Nothing, nothing happened on your farm, your farm's all golden. Something to talk about to your neighbours who probably can take this, uh, this presentation. Okay, uh, you're being very gracious and I have about another, how long have I got there, Cliff? 10 minutes? 15? Oh, I'm sorry, folks. So heat stress is an issue I wanted to touch on. I'm not going to give you another 45 minutes on heat stress. I wanted to, next slide please, to touch on a couple of hot pot issues. It's warm outside, so it's probably germane to uh, where we are. We'll take that, oh, you've got it, sir, thank you. So this is the new heat stress chart here, and all it's really showing you is uh, how susceptible today's modern dairy cow is to heat stress, and how much we really have to put into heat abatement. Yeah, we can claim as nutritionists to do all sorts of fancy things with feeding cows, but if you can get something organized with heat abatement, you know, with the collecting areas, over the resting area, okay, over the feeding area, dry cows as well, surprisingly enough, there's some great work coming from Santos in Florida. Six pounds of extra milk there for heat abatement cows in the dry period. Good news. Well, it's been researched now, so we do know. Just want you to cast your eye over to this chart here, it's a temperature and humidity index. What it just gives you is 
reach down and hide down here. Humidity over there. You've all seen it. And it's humid today, of course, and I've no doubt it's creeping over 74, 76, quite close to play, it'll get even warmer. It doesn't take too long for the cows to get into a bit of heat stress. You can recognize it, or your team can recognize it, or your nutritionist can recognize it by at least you know, counting the respiration rate of the breath and just, just see what's going on there. So heat stress is real, even here in the northeast. There's a lady there using the magazine to use as a fan, so I think that's a pretty good example to say that heat stress is real. It's not just about heat, it's also about humidity. I don't know about you guys, I can see a lot of shiny foreheads there, and I think it's, it's heat stress. Okay, next slide, please, good. So the cows feel that. We're sat down doing nothing, we're sedentary. These 80, 90 pound cows, when you look at the energetics, that's four times maintenance. That's like doing the Tour de France or something like that. So if you can imagine the Tour de France and these temperature communities, that's what your cows are feeling. They've got a lot more fur and hair than you have, so they screw and keep down. Plus they've got a fermentation that chucks out a lot of heat. So we kind of know that cows by biological history belong to the Ice Age. So in reality, they'll be really comfortable, really comfortable, okay, at about 35 to 45 degrees Fahrenheit. That's where they do their best. We're nowhere near that at the moment. The heat stress cow is a Sarah cow. I'm not saying your cows, you'll all be hunky dory and heat abatement. Every pen I can think of on your farm on that heat abatement plan is going to be 10 to the dozen, even better than the industry standard, which we can talk about in the long term. But it will affect intake, energetics, milk production, and milk component yield. Next slide, please. Now, um, there's a, just wait for the slide here, folks. Next slide, please, Cliff. There we go. There is a lot of biology on this I, I'm, I'm not going to spend time going into, okay? I'm just going to get, get the main points. Lower appetite, less spiral digestive books in the room with them. Slower rate of passage. If you've got less appetite, a slower rate of passage, any starch or sugar in there spends more time being fermented, generates more acid at the same time. So that's one thing that we forget about these stress down. That increases the risk of stale, okay? Rumen contractions also slow down in heat stress cows. If you can start to count respiration bits per minute in your cows, above 70 breaths per minute, it's not too difficult to do. You can spend a bit of time in there and do that. Once you know you've got those respiration rates increased, it doesn't have to be overt panting like the slide, you're not going to have slow rumen contractions. Slow rumen contractions means less mixing in the rumen, more hot spots, more that burnt wall that we saw on the second slide there. Next slide, please, Cliff. We're romping through these to give you time for questions. You're going to have less rumination. Hotter cows tend to stamp and don't like to lie down. No matter what you're betting on. I mean, mattresses and straw and shavings, they're good insulators, so that's, a, that's not going to help them. Sand poles are heat, so you tend to find when cows kind of frown and heat stress. You know? So, less line time, less rumination, more challenge to the feet. This is the there. One thing you will do when you're breathing out quickly, we can just all do this a little bit just to help put you down. So just all go with me now, start breathing real hard. Come on, chickens. <laughs> You'll feel better. So people from my part of the world used to eat curry, which is really hot food to make you sweat and pant while you're eating. Even the temperature of 90 degrees could help cool you down. So what the cow's doing now when she's panting, we're all blowing out carbon dioxide. So what the cow's doing, as well as shunting towards a rumen, subacute rumen acidosis, and acidosis of rumen, when she's blowing out that carbon dioxide, she has to shift the acid base balance. It's a ratio of bicarbonate and carbon dioxide in the bloodstream she has to maintain. She's shifting that by blowing out the carbon dioxide. So now she has to do sodium bicarbonate, which is one of the key elements in buffering in the saliva. But unfortunately, what will happen is to maintain her acid base balance in the blood, she'll kick out sodium bicarbonate in the urine. So now, She'll have less bicarbonate put in the saliva, which is one of her internal role eight yeah, gel free cars. So now the heat stress cow's really under it. She's got a subacute rumen acidosis and she's got a blood acidosis she can't escape from. Which is why I'm saying to you guys, yeah, as nutritionists, we think we can do smart things. But the smartest thing you guys can do is put in fans and sprinkles and make sure you don't get those high respiration rates and those. Typically, heat stress cows are about 0.5% units lower than the rumen pH. Some of the work we saw before of the temperate conditions. Next slide, please, Cliff. We're learning with fans, we're going to have to be really aggressive on the uh, heat abatement. Uh, this is a slide from the state of New York in a year similar to this. And um, 
all of my first you know. um, and, and what's happened here is I had a temperature data logger inside the barn in an area just to see what was happening. And uh, if you looked at the sort of tricky area where the cows start to respond here, 65, 70, well certainly here, this barn didn't have fans. And it had the standard fan placement, you know, so you got like the three foot fans, 30 foot apart, 30 degree angle, industry standard in the day, but you know those fans dissipate, you know, proportionately to the square root of something. So it's used not much for mathematician, but you know, you stand close to a fan, you feel it, you stand 20 feet away, you don't feel so much. So what was happening here, there were times when that barn wasn't getting cool, and you can imagine as you got towards the you know, late afternoon, early evening, early night time, those cows were really suffering. So if you want to kind of walk around here with me, 21% of the time, 75, 27% of the time, 75 to 80, this isn't a bar with heat abatement fans. Again, the message being, you can manage it if you know what it is, data log is cheap, if you put data log in the bar, you can find out exactly what sort of challenge your cows are coming under. And then here, 80 to 85, there was a time here, 85 to 90, and then up to 100. So again, this, this, this barn, that heat abatement, didn't know we had a hidden heat stress problem, a tail in the day, we might expect it, if you didn't measure it, you wouldn't know. So great time to count your respiration rates is uh, safety and nutrition issue working overtime. I'd like you in the barn between five and seven at night, Rumination and the respiration rates, and uh, just tell me what's going on. Not a bad thing to do this time of year. If you've got good numbers, you're home free. Next slide, please. Yeah, I'm, I'm racing to the finish. So, in terms of milk production and milk component losses, it's typically about $1.12 a cow a day. There are other issues that will accrue in terms of fertility and herd health. Uh, we don't have time um, to go in here today. Next slide, please. But and if my memory is correct, sometimes at 58 years old, I have senior moments. It isn't always, but this is, in fact, the last slide, so the senior moment hasn't caught with me yet. So I'm going to conclude and thank you for your attention. So I think, quite rightly so, there's more interest in high forage TMRs for dairy cows. That's a given, that's where we need to be, keep those grain costs in control. We just need to think sometimes that corn silage, although it's a forage, it's a forage in disguise. High water shell corn on a stick. Okay? That necessarily means that Sarah will not be eradicated. It might be reduced, but it won't be eradicated on high forage TMR. So Sarah becomes the occupational hazard of the modern lactation dairy cow. Fresh cows, cows in lactation, high production cows, cows in lactation. The problem is once the insult occurs, it carries all the way through. So you can still see cows in late lactation that are aggressively pending in excess of 15, 20, 25, 30 percent. Still had an unusual meal time and pushed themselves towards Sarah. We saw sorting, we saw the end syndrome, some of the practical things that happen on farms every day pushing those cows over the edge. So a multifactorial problem is required. It's going to need your nutritionist, your feeder team, your vet, and some due diligence to sort through what the cows are telling you and what some of the metrics that the quality are telling you. We tried to show you using the pH promises that there is it. There is a hidden rubber there called Sarah, and um, we didn't expect it under a call time on a high forage NDF DMR to be able to demonstrate those presence. And if you're interested in talking about technology for a soft, quiet conjunction plug, please do talk to my colleagues Bill and Caitlin and Jeff over there. They have some interesting things to talk to you about about uh, ways of infinite solutions for managing Sarah challenges in the area. Okay, you've been very gracious, you're still wide awake, which is remarkable. My wife usually falls asleep after 30 minutes conversation with me. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to wind up with the time for questions, and I appreciate you coming here and being with us this morning. Thanks once again to uh, North East Dairy Thank you. Feed it. You want to try and spread out you know, those feeds as many times during the day 
as you can. So how many times a day would you think you're compoing? Twice? Four, four times is nice. So what would be the maximum amount of any one feed that the, uh, typically? A feeding. So that's aggressive. Okay, I'm not saying you're not getting the milk, that's aggressive. On the plus side, dry shell corn meal is not cemented with the materials. Generally speaking, to give you a rule of thumb, now remember, as a nutritionist, I can make work for anybody because I don't have to do it. But if you if you can look at the way cows will pass meal sizes out, let's kind of think about, you know, TMRs as I referenced point and expanding the component feeding. If you looked at a, a, a typical number in TMR for a high producing cow with good rumen health, good milk component, let's say we went to farms and visited, their dry matter intake would be somewhere around about okay, 55 to 60 pounds per head per day. Now remember what we said before, cows generally choose to eat, but for a reasonable comfort level, before you get to buy carbon and use products, they tend to eat about 8 to 10 times a day. So you kind of pass it out and say, well in reality, a comfortable meal size for a cow, total you know, for grain, is going to be like about 4, 5, 6 pounds. When you go to general and dairy science, that's typically what you find. If you have something more aggressive with corn meal, you get into you get into more hot water. You're certainly going to want some of your bicarb as part of that, and then think about some yeast technology to uh, to mitigate against the, the pH drops, or more more correctly, the pH is going to drop, rescue that pH as, as quickly as possible. Um, we used to do this in the UK all the time, just so you know, and. Um, the biggest challenge wasn't that people didn't understand, it's what they could do with the time available. The more you can split the feeds up to stay under four or five pounds of grain allocation a day, the better off the cow's room is going to be. If you can't do that, start to bring in technologies that enable you to uh, do that. But discuss it with your nutritionist as well, because I'm not your incumbent nutritionist and just say some crazy English guy around this time. Is he full of it or is there something you should take? And then, and you can, I can give you my card, you can always phone me in grain and tune me out. But I'd like to hear a better idea if you disagree, not just tune me out. Tony, I think we're going to have to uh, wrap it up if that's okay. Oh, is it? Thank you. Oh, oh, oh. Sorry. <laughs> I missed the idea. It's the equipment you have. That's fine. Tony, thank you very thank much. You. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's thank Tony once again for his presentation.